Oh, there's an echo. So you need to shut the sound off. So if I shut the sound off, then I won't hear the echo. Hi, everyone. Let us know in the chat if you can see us, if you can hear us. Taking a moment to breathe together, that was a lot. We took in a lot of information. And you hear us too. Hi, Tahea. Hi, Natalia. And you can hear okay as well. <laughs> Old Hampshire pals. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Thank you, Ziva. Tara's here. We have local in the house. We have Hampshire in the house. We have Italy in the house. We have the Sistrum, the, the, the his sacred Sistrum, ceremonial Sistrum in the house. Wow. So I'm here. I'm Barbara Gale, going live for the first time. I'm glad this is working so far. And I'm here with my beloved partner, Jeff Hanna. Right. We all just watched together um, Lane's presentation, which had a really long title. She was blending all of these astounding connections that she was always making. That, just so you know, that was typical of being in the presence of Lane. We would sit together in the circle, whether in chairs or on the floor, and she would talk. It wasn't just about drumming, although she loved it when we drummed, and she loved drumming, and obviously she was a master drummer. But these retreats that were so intense, immersive, starting from usually like Friday evening through Sunday after lunch, we couldn't drum the whole time. That, that would be impossible to do. We don't have the endurance for that. It would be physically exhausting. Our, our forearms would be aching and our ears would be ringing. There was a lot of talk and mostly lame. Us sitting at the foot of the master and listening to her present the connections that she was making in that current time. Her work was constantly evolving. She was always doing research. So yeah, it was, um, this was a lot. This particular um, setting, Shelly Stanback told me the other day when we saw her, she was my, my roomie back in the days of giving birth to ourselves, which was Lane's six month intensive training, the subject, of course, of death, transformation, rebirth, renewal, always read in Lane's work. And of course, today being the 10th anniversary of her passing, I feel like Lane, I'm getting a download of too many thoughts at once. It's, it's like, what do I say first? So I want to honor that this is the 10th anniversary of her passing. And it's just amazing to me that she went to pass away um, during the season of Scorpio, ruled by Pluto, god of death, birth, rebirth, transformation, and all. And that the 10th anniversary today would also fall on the eclipse, the lunar eclipse, happening in Taurus, but the sun is in Scorpio, and it's square Pluto. So it's amazing to me, you know, Taurus is the bull and Lane showed us the images, how in this presentation, the bull, which was representative of the fallopian tube and squirrel. Yes. And so, it has to be taken off. Oh, okay. It's bothering. Thank you. Sorry. Um, the, uh, the bull representative, representative of the fallopian tubes and and then showing up in Brazil as Bumba Meu Boy, the resurrection story and reenactment. So I think I just touched on 10 stories at once. But that's 
how my brain works too, which is why I think I resonated so much with Lane's presentations. So we're all taking in all of this information that we just received. And if you have any um, notes that you wrote down for comments, aha moments, questions, we can start in the live chat. And I've asked Maya to help me keep up and Jeff as well to keep up with the chat because I can't do everything at once. It's a lot to do. But yeah, that was basically how we would spend a good percentage of our time with Lane, with her just talking to us. And a lot of times it was just a stream of consciousness based on what she'd been researching, the music that she and Tommy were working on at the time. So I noticed Tommy B was there with us in that presentation. I don't know if you're here now. Um, but yeah, th they were working, this was in 1998, Lane's first GBTO, Giving Birth to Ourselves weekend, and Tommy was assisting, and um, yeah, there was, a, there was a lot of her talking about what they were learning as they were working on their albums, and during that summer, they were working on Championing the Chakras. And that's one of my favorite CDs of hers. And she was working on all of the seed syllables and the yantras, the, the, the visual aspects of the mantra and how it, if we would focus our minds on that in our meditation and how it would clear the mind and bring us to deeper states of awareness. And she was always about the deeper states of awareness, including especially through the drum. So there was a lot in this presentation that was fairly new to me in that I, uh, Jeff and I had not been with her in those um, last years after we delivered her and her cats and her cash <laughs> to Salvador de Bahia, Brazil to help her move in 2008. We were still trying to get our lives together in Florida, and I didn't even realize when she relocated to Asheville. Oh, so what I was starting to say that Shelley had mentioned that she believes that that particular presentation that we just watched was filmed in her home. That's good. Um, where she was, Shelley believes, and we can see Deborah Roberts sitting next to her, the beekeeper. And thank goodness Shelly introduced the two of them, and that really helped Lane to go even deeper into all of the connections she made around the bee priestess mysteries that many of her workshops started to have more and more of a flavor of. Even her giving birth to her, giving birth to ourselves, giving birth to herself um, was evolving. She was continuing to learn and grow and research. And yes, weave, she was weaving so much information into a beautiful tapestry. Yes, to Heya. Yeah, like Karen is saying, mind blown. It's, it's, um, it was always mind blowing. And I imagine that her brain was in a constant state of, of being blown. And that's why her delivery of this information went off the history of consciousness and yet, good thing she would have those images to keep rolling. She could be bringing in more and more information. What really stood out is if you think about, we're always experiencing every new level of technology for travel and communication as making our world seem smaller. And then you see all this we just saw, and you realize the world was always small. Hmm. Everybody was always connected. Everybody had a lot of the same experience of the universe and experience of life in this thin, delicate layer of life on this planet. And how you see the symbols so, continuing to show up across everywhere. cultures, like collective consciousness. Everywhere, working. but they didn't have the kind of communication and travel technology. So it makes you wonder. I sometimes think that we are connected, part of, we come from some infinite consciousness. 
so that that can happen all over the planet. Yeah, thank you for that so, input. Yeah, the world's always been small, obviously. People couldn't access each other. We were all accessing something in common. And perhaps it was those deeper states of awareness that people had in their practices because they weren't distracted by television and computers. They were so connected into their own eco landscape. And the mycelium that covers the globe, it was like a, just as mycelium is the, the nervous system, the brain waves, and the communication connections between plants helps one plant communicate to another, even across species. These people were so connected deeply. And yes, in their own traditions too, but their traditions were born out of the practices that they held in their intimate connection with nature, with Mother Earth, Gaia, as they experienced her, there was no real separation. And so they were receiving the same messages and downloads that others were in other parts of the world. So we see a lot of the symbols showing up again and again, the umpodos, which Ling described as being, you know, a bound a belly, a breast, a beehive, the buzzing place where only the, the inaudible, unstruck, unmanifested sound of the bindu, that, that sacred dot center, can emanate from. So, yeah, she pulled together, she did her research, and the, I saw what you said to Haya in the, uh, the premiere of that video lecture that she really needed to be given a PhD for all the research that she had done. And actually when we were at PASIC in November of 2021, the Percussive Arts Society's International Convention, the annual event, and, and back then Lane was being posthumously inducted into their Hall of Fame some of us went out to eat up at Lane's favorite Japanese restaurant and had green tea in her honor, her favorite beverage. And we knew that this was her favorite restaurant because it was Rick Mattingly who came up to us during the banquet. Lane was being honored along with the other three and actually the four who were being honored in 2020 because the convention didn't happen in 2020. So there were a lot of people being inducted into the Hall of Fame in November 21. And there were a bunch of us there honoring Lane. Not as many people as we thought would attend because of the current situation with the pandemic. But Rick Mattingly approached our table during the banquet. He's the editor of, the, of Percussive Notes, the Percussive Art Society's um, magazine. And I didn't know him before. We didn't know him before, but he approached us and I he knew said, his name Yeah, from the from he's, he's a writer who had written about Lane, interviewed Lane. Obviously, spent a lot of time with Lane and a became a very close friend of Lane. And he was one who was really pushing for her to be inducted into the Hall of Fame even years earlier. He had um, proposed that she be inducted and it didn't happen. So he was part of the committee for her induction in 2021. So when he approached us, he said, I'd love to meet up with you all at the restaurant where Lane and I would always meet at these conventions. And it's around the corner. This is in Indianapolis. And he also shared with me um, photos of he and Lane together at the Rhythm Discovery Museum that the Progressive Art Society had built and opened there in Indianapolis around the corner. And we met up at this little Japanese restaurant for, for Lane. It was like a quiet oasis to, to go and have her Japanese green tea. And um, it was special that we met up there. And why we didn't take a picture of all of us, we even did a 
a cheers, a l'chaim, with all of our green tea ceramic cups in the center of the table and why we, we were just so caught up in the moment. Usually I'm, I'm, I live my life through my camera lens and why I didn't hand the server my phone and say, will you please take a picture up? So we have, we have no, um, what do you call it? Memorabilia other than what's, what we carry in our hearts. But that was really, that was a special moment. Um, and why I even brought that up. When, when I come up with these subjects, sometimes I don't remember where the thread started. Thank you. And during that conversation, thank you. And during that conversation, that was what we said. Thank you for helping me circle back. Um, Lane really needed to have been given an honorary PhD for her research. So maybe someday that will happen. Yeah, so was not a woman with cake. <laughs> what was not a woman with? Oh, I'm well, a woman with. About a woman with a yeah, woman are you statue. Karen? Are you referring to um, the image of Persephone with that huge umphalos on her head? And I, and I said, yeah, it's like a woman carrying a cake on her head. It does look to me. It looks like a huge wedding cake or a birthday cake. More of a cake than. Women like Randros, where they were described in museum tags as women with cake. There's a cake on edge. <laughs> this did look more like it, but, uh, one of the many umphaloses of this presentation. Yes. You're awfully down there. My, that, that chair is my uh -huh. desk chair. If you want to use the handle uh, gotcha. on the side, no, you can use the handle on the side. You can come up. I'm, I'm not taller than he is. So I'd love to hear. Um, I'd love to hear your own aha moments. We've just shared some bars in these 17 minutes, and there are 17 of you here. So, you know, what were your aha moments, your questions? I'm, I, we're not lame, but we spent a lot of time with her, and there are other people here who spent a lot of time with her. I don't feel like Jeff and I need to answer all the questions. Anyone else who, who may have some insights as to uh, making Further connections, um, answering any questions. The chat is open and it's live. It's set to live chat. So feel free to, to chime in, everybody. Um, what did you love about it? What was confusing? Um, until anything shows up, I'll just I'll just keep talking. You know me, I'll talk to the cows come home. There's so much about the umphalos, and I always come back. Wait, I thought the umphalos was the navel. <laughs> It is. And here's press. Here's it here's a mouth. And here's a tall mouth. Looks like a cake. Here's it's like it is so many things that then I come back around. It. I thought you said that was the navel. So it's a lot for my little head to contain sometimes. Um, and there was so much in there that was referred to as the open. So just acknowledging you might get as confused as I do, but maybe not. And she began with the Pindu. Um, that purple circle with the black, black dots all the way around it and the, the dot in the center with the line going out and how that was the bindu representing the, the compacted, unstruck, unmanifested sound. And then the umphalos has its correlations to the unma unmanifested, inaudible sound. And then she went directly from the, the bindu, that circle with the line through it, to the Paleolithic image carved in stone of the female, uh, the vulva. There's no such thing as a non-female vulva, I don't think, <laughs> of the vulva and from which all life comes, the greatest mystery of all. Why are we here? How do we get here? Aside from the fact that we know what takes place in order for the gestation this mystery of birth and the the other mystery of death. And the umphalos also representing the breast, another great mystery of women's breasts being able to feed the infant nourishment. And um, how does a woman turn water into milk, into blood, Lane would say. 
And she also talked about, I'll say one more thing, and then I'll, I'm reading some, some comments here. That's great. I'm glad the comments are coming in. Keep them going. Um, how the fetus would develop. Well, I talk about this all the time in the workshops. And this comes directly from Lane. The fetus develops to the pulse of the mother's blood. And notice that she did say it's heartbeat. And I pointed out, the heart and the womb here, there's some space there. And the recording that Lane took from inside the womb is very different than the love dub rest, love dub rest, love dub rest of the heart. It's more like a of the blood. And that is the pulse with which all of our sense perceptions develop in every aspect of who we each individually are from the moment that we become two cells develops for eight or nine months or however long you are in that womb, rocking and rolling to the pulse of the mother's blood. So all of those kinds of connections and those particular ones are really early on in Redmond. She was still selling the cassette of the recording of the pulse of the mother's blood. And on the other side of it was her guiding us on meditation to that pulse. She just kept going. She kept going. She kept going. Her research didn't, didn't stop. So, um, so yes. Uh, Tafea, there was new images there that I hadn't seen before. So I'm very much feeling like I want to watch this a few more times. Yeah, it's a lot to take in. To digest all that as Tahea said. And uh, Tara wants to know if you know anything about the practice in Bokeh. Yes, the Brahmari practice is a, um, a yogic practice. And as I understand it from Lane, because she was really into it when we were at GBTO and she taught us how to do it. Tori was the best at it. Tori, if you're, you're here, you, you got really good at it. Where we try to, to bring all of, um, you know, relaxing all the, the muscles of face and head and begin a humming sound, the humming of bees somehow sending that humming up into the sinuses and it vibrate, vibrates all the temporal bones. And it's believed as a yogic practice that it, it instantaneously clears the mind in preparation for deeper yoga, uh, deeper meditation, yoga practice, drumming, whatever. And the, the, the buzz of the frame drum being related to the buzz of the bees is another way to just bring ourselves into that state. And you can try it now. I can't say that I'm really good at it, but if you just allow your lips to softly close and hum, and if you close up part of your throat, it's like something you do in your throat. I wonder if I can describe it. Can you hear the difference? I close a little bit into the throat and I try to make it more nasally. That's the, the Brahmari um, practice. And that image that she showed of Brahmari, I've seen that in, in my online too, where um, there's the the bee goddess of India and the, the bees are coming out and it's all golden behind her. So it's one of the images that Lane showed um, in that video too. By the way, that video will, will be there. Be there. I have a, a playlist called Lane Redmond. Anytime I find anything of Lane speaking, performing her, her discography, anything Lane Redmond related, I throw it into that playlist because her primary YouTube channel is gone. It's a shame because I think, I, I imagine that this lecture was probably on there. And uh, so I got this lecture from her Dropbox when she came 
available to us after the passing, which I'll remind everybody was 10 years ago today, October 28th. And in um, just a couple of hours, we'll also be having the full moon, the lunar eclipse. So it's, uh, it's all really connected. Last year at the anniversary of Lane's passing, I created a, a YouTube video reading one of Lane's essays that she had handed to us at one of the workshops. I went to many, and I couldn't remember exactly which one, but I asked some of my friends if they have a copy of it too. It's just a one-page essay. Um, what's it called? The, the one about um, excavating the archaeology of my ruins. And um, it's the archaeology of my ruins. And I read it aloud, and I did it in honor of Nate's, um, the anniversary of her death, because um, as a labor of love, a uh, labor of love, Miranda Rondo um, moderate, moderates these Facebook pages all dedicated to Lane and creates a, a special event page. The anniversary of Lane's birthday here, August 19, and on the anniversary of what I call her death day, October 28th. And on those special um, event pages on Facebook, it's, it's like a, a clearinghouse where people can submit their stories through video, photos, or text links to their articles, links to their videos, paying tribute to Lynn Redmond. And we do this twice a year, in August on her birthday and October on her death day. So after this, if you didn't know about it, you can go to Facebook and just look for that tribute to Lane Redmond's um, 10th anniversary of her passing. And you'll see some people who I've never even heard of. I was looking at it the other day, articles written, one of, one of the, um, who was on the trip, the first and second trip, Lane guided to Crete. And I kick myself that I didn't go to Crete or Cyprus with Lane. And it's his journal entries. And he was one of the people who worked with Lane at the publishing house called Sounds True. And there's another, another article, which was really very moving, written by, what was his name? Oh, shoot, I was just talking with Shelley about this yesterday. Steve or Steven? who cared for Lane in the last six weeks of her life. And he's writing about that and his time with Lane. And anyone, whether you knew Lane or not, how Lane has affected your life, um, how her work has affected her, her, her work has affected your life, you can post something there. Just even if you just discovered her book a month ago and you're reading it and we know that it's life changing. And so you have something to say too. So we always encourage everyone to share there in that space. So anyway, so. Um, so I had to go. So I had to research on Hathor curls. Oh, good. And she's mentioning for those who, I assume everybody can see the chat. So. And if you don't know who Tehea is, she is the one who has. Been resurrecting the sistrum. Now I'll hold it back here. If my little jingle bell bracelet <laughs> was bothersome, just um, prepare for this. And this is the Hathor ceremonial sistrum that Tehea, see if my camera can focus, that Tehea um, created with Mid East Manufacturing, now known as Ensoul. And she did a lot of research on the ceremonial sistrum. And Lane showed um, sistrum in that presentation just now. And it was the precursor to the tambourine when the jingles were put on the frame drum as women processed with frame drums and with sistrum. And then I like to say it's like, to me, it's the best combination, um, the tambourine. I, that's my, my jam. Um, Actually, and that was just a way to get rid of half of the employees. <laughs> Stop it. No, it was not. <laughs> to, it was like combining peanut butter and chocolate, putting the best combination together. So Tehea has done her own research and has her own presentations going. So shout out to Tehea. And she's saying in the chat that she has an article that revisits the question of the 
those curls like um, the goddess Hathor had in one of those images where she was holding like this. <laughs> the, my frame drum back there. Holding the, the, the frame drum, the moon, the sun above her head. Um, and those, those curls of that girl and Farrah Fawcett and of Lane, early Lane. You want to use that? on the side to bring yourself up high a bit. I'm, I'm having a tall complex. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a short person and I'm not used to being. Um, so yeah, so the hairstyles described as Hathoric are to be found in Mesopotamia, leading to his um, comment, and predate the first appearance of the curls in Egypt. Well, that's interesting. So they're found in Mesopotamia first. Excellent. So Sarah from the Netherlands, I know you from my YouTube channel. Oh, your mind is she MJ. Just said Where did she say go? Thank you. Oh, I thought she's. Oh, I thought you said I. I didn't really. That's what she said. So she may see this later. Um, and Karen has a guest who's arrived, and she had to leave as well. Gwena Percussion, hello, nice to meet you. Yeah, it's um. It. The buzz is really amazing, the reverberating. That was, you know, like I said, when we would gather with Lane for these retreats, it wasn't all drumming because it wasn't something that was, um, it wasn't something that anyone could do for extended periods. It was a lot of presentation and talk and a lot of guided meditation. And the Brownery was one of the ones that she taught us. So yeah, give that a try, that, that inner buzz. As Randy Crafton would say about drumming, he's in it for the buzz. I mean, drumming <coughs> is uh, has its own buzz effect. The trance like it's into some buzz. Anyone else? Um, oh, no, Anya, I'm just seeing your. That just showed up um, in my field of vision. Oh, I remember that. They were referring to the Frank Drums cake. Yes, there was an image of um, a priestess from Mesopotamia in, toward the very end of Lane's presentation in that video. And I use this one a lot as well because it's a beautiful clay. Um, with a, the, the woman has a very pleasant face and it's very simple and she has kind of a, a triangular loincloth, um, a downward facing triangle. I can do that with my hands. Um, which points to the vulva and the, the lower chakras. And the upward facing triangle is from, from the, the center of the um, solar plexus, the downward is from the solar plexus on down and points to the vulva. So she has that kind of as like a little loincloth and she's holding a frame drum you know, in her hand, a small one. She's holding a small frame drum in her hand, upright like this. And Lane told us that in the museum, it actually said, the anthropologist had actually named it Woman with Cake. And it was such a joke, you know, I, who can carry a cake vertically? If you have a cake on a plate, it's carried like this, which is why when we saw that image, of um, Aphrodite, was it? The umpelos on her head. And it was like this huge birthday cake, wedding cake to me. Um, made the joke woman with cake. So that's such a big um, a big deal. But just holding the frame drum the way you play it, we, it became known as cake position. Right. As opposed to lap position, when you set it on your thigh, you put a bigger frame drum. Right. This, so if you're holding this it this way position, and playing this it, uh, Lane just called it cake position. Just playing off of that. So this way, museum. cake position. But anyway, that woman is piling wood while listening. One of my favorite activities, piling wood, stacking wood. <laughs> I don't miss it at all. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't do it. Yeah, I did. Like, yes. Um... Yeah, so, oh, and Taya says, as an aside, you found a, a 
2014 article titled New Perspective on Pathoric Curls by Hélène Pouillon. I assume that's French. It looks French to me. Well, that's cool. Even more information about those pathoric curls. Very cool. Woman with cake plate. Uh, oh, that's Khadija who said she's piling wood. Oh, that's cool. Feels like putting money in the bank, doesn't it? Um, all right, any any aha moments, any questions? Um, I loved when, Le I'll just keep talking until more questions and comments come up. Lane talked about how, you know, the, the drum was used, rhythm was used, as well as the rhythmic movement and rhythmic chant was used to unify the group. Once the consciousness was unified, then the rhythm was used to drive it down even deeper into deeper states of awareness. And that's what we were talking about, where people tapped into those um, collective unconscious, uh, these, these symbolic images that show up everywhere from, you know, even in a, in a Navajo painting that was done during meditative state that shows seven chakras and the hip heavens and the sacred birds in the heavens. So it's very cool that she just kept making these connections. And I, I, like I said in the description of that video, once Lane hands you this lens, you look through everything through her perspective, things don't ever look the same. You'll start seeing the bindu in every flower. Um, and you'll think of the lotus as well. And You'll see a, a mound, a hill somewhere in the landscape think of the umpalos. Go to any museum and go to the antiquity section. They might have um, ancient artifacts from Greece and the Greek-influenced Italian art. Jeff and I did that when we traveled. We were just at the Richmond, um, well, the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in and as well as up in Tampa, Florida. I say up because we're south of that. Um, and I took so many photographs, more photographs of the one uh, of uh, images in Tampa of women with frame drums and libation bowls and the gods and the goddesses and the laurel wreaths, which remember were uh, significant of um, those who were the the oracles, so that they could go into deeper states of awareness and see past, present, and future at once. And Lane showed an image of a king who was standing before one of the oracles who was holding her bowl. Perhaps she was lighting incense in the bowl or had oils or sacred oils or about to pour forth her libation bowl and she was holding a laurel wreath. It, it's symbolic of their ability to go into those oracular states so that they could um, advise kings and priests and priestesses. Okay, so what's been happening in the chat? Talk more about cake. Uh, Teresa said it actually said, I'm holding cake plate. And I had never picked up on that one. Ah, about it. interesting. That one of Aphrodite with the huge cake on her head that complains of the umpolos, or uh, which one? Or the Tara one? Tara wants to know which music. Oh, the Tampa Museum of Art in Tampa. Jeff and I were just there a couple months ago. And never, well, we had actually been there a long time ago, but we didn't have this kind of lens. Although there were a couple of things that, that we saw, and they had a, um, a special exhibit collection from various museums around Greece and Italy. It was a special collection that was traveling. And we went to it. This was back in like 2002. And before the day of having a camera with you. <laughs> and I wish I could have taken pictures. There were certain things that the, that the museum said it was a depiction of that I totally disagree. And it's because of what I learned from Lane that I had a completely different take on what I was looking at. It showed an archway with a woman inside the archway on a recliner and a line of men outside the archway. And it's a friend lining up for a prostitution encounter. And Lane taught us that part of the sacred rites was having sacred sex union 
with the priestesses as a way of getting close to, closer to the gods and goddesses and reaching that ecstatic state. And there were women who had, and probably men too, had that specific role in their society and their culture. So when you when you look at it through the lens of our culture, you get one thing. If you look at it through the lens of what Lane Redmond had unearthed and presented to us, things start to look very, very different. And it's um, it's kind of hard to put our cultural biases aside and consider these things. But I'm I'm grateful that she that she taught us this. Um, we're, so we're let's here. see. Did you say something about Bay of Fundy? Not Bay of Funny, Bay of Fundy. How did you? What are you referring to? I'm not. I'm not sure. Oh, and Lisa Carlton is asking it. Anything new known regarding the Phrygian scale? Are Are you aware? Well, I'm going to go turn the air conditioner on. In music, Please. there are modes: the uh, Mixolydian mode, the Phrygian mode. Um, there's a handful of different modes and uh, different scales. Uh, so if you want to know more about that, probably Google that up and see what all you can learn about the Phrygian scale. It has to do with scale of notes and and the aesthetic of a certain culture, what what they were used to hearing. Tommy, are you here at all, Tommy? I think maybe you would know about some of these things because I'm not aware. Um, and you're saying the death date following day will be the birth of eight new drummers. Ah, you're holding on a workshop or class. Remind everybody where you are, please. Cut it off. Um, let's see. That was a curiosity for me as well. Connection to the rhythm pattern. Yeah, see, she would just the connections she made. It was it was unending. Or there's a group starting their frame drumming journey in a small island in the Bay of Fundy, the birth after the death day. Good, perfect timing. And yeah, Miranda is teaching a workshop. Miranda Rodeau is teaching a workshop in San Diego this afternoon in honor of. Lane. Um, Lane, Lane, I feel, and one reason why I related her related to her spell was that death and transformation and rebirth were her middle name, and it's the same for me. I'm constantly um, giving birth to myself. It's just a theme in my my life and my life journey. And I loved what Lane said about the. Um, gosh, and I wrote some of that down. That was really, yeah, the harim is a chanting mantra chanted by the created. We are the created to the creator, the source, about what is this life about? What are we doing here? How did we get here? And what is this all about? Um, I loved that reflecting, um, on you know having that conversation with source with the cre with creator through a chanting mantra to to just calm the mind and allow that information to come in you know, what, what is this as lane said something and i'm paraphrasing about you know, what is the meaning of my path what what's this journey about for me where am i going now I'm always asking that. I'm seated. Jeff and I are seated here in my my office, my, my room space, and above the door, I have a, a drawing that I did in third grade of butterflies, a symbol of transformation, and it says, um, "What does it say? Where am I going? Or where am I going now?" I did that in third grade. I've always been wondering, where, where am I going now? And they have the images of butterflies going in three which direction. I had forgotten about Freem. I remember Lane talking about that and in recent times I ah. uh, learned a lot more about oh uh, when, uh, is the, the root chakra and you bring it on up the next universal sound, ooh, and that's 
the uh, kids where you're, he's pointing to his, his abdomen. <laughs> well, you know where the room heart. chakra is in the heart chakra. And then the mm -hmm. goes up to your throat chakra. Throat to nose. Forehead. And All that stuff about those are sounds of the universe, um, and I haven't been hearing anything since Lane about other universal sounds like "hream," which makes sense. If you, there's a lot more to it than just "ah." Yeah, she talked about all those seed syllables. Continue. The universe has more than one note, and. So I got to look into that. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know how you spell it, but I wrote H A R E. -M. No, it's just H R E E M. She said H R I M or H R E E M. But there wouldn't be an I, and they're not hurrying. Uh, okay. It would just be Hreem. breath coming up the throat. Hreem. Hreem. And Lisa Carton says <laughs> Shamani Jane, Jane talks about it. Okay, so people can. Shamini. Jane, Jane, very cool. My introduction to the chakras, I had heard of them, but it, my introduction to the chakras was through the, so it was through the drum, through the seed syllables. And, um, and then she ex really expanded into that when she and Tommy were working on the CD chanting the chakras, which is, like I said, one of my favorites. It's wonderful to move to for moving meditation. It's really wonderful. I'm going to see if I can. Um, there's a, a fan going on my MacBook. I'm going to see if I can. I'm afraid to um, get rid of this other page. I'm going to take that out. Okay, good. Perhaps the fan will quiet down if that was distracting. I don't know if people can hear that. Yeah, so much to review. <sighs> Thank you for being here. Tahaya and everyone who is here. Um, you, you, you like Lane said, you have to just look at everything. I wrote that down. You have to just look at everything. Just open your eyes and open your ears. Listen. The next time you're walking through a garden and you hear the buzzing of bees, oftentimes when I see a bee in a garden, I just say, hi, Lane. I feel like, like she's, she, she's here. Her, her presence. You've been getting multiple thank yous for doing this. Well, my, you know, uh, my pleasure. You know, when people thank me, all I can say is this is my passion and pleasure. It's my obsession, actually, as Jeff knows. This is just kind of, it's, it's a full circle for me. I had put the frame drum down for a while and really just made my living after I left, after we relocated the Rhythm Inlet from Maine to Florida. The frame drum had its had its moments here in Florida, but it wasn't like it was in Maine. And I continued to make my living teaching djembe and facilitating drum circles. And we had the Rhythm Inlet store, which kept us busy. We got into Brazilian drumming thanks to Lane because we went to Brazil with her twice. And samba drumming was just awesome. I got really turned on to the candomblé spiritual practices and uh, drum and dance thanks to Lane while we were there. So there were pieces of Lane's work that carried through the years after we moved, relocated to Florida. And like I said I, earlier, I wasn't even all that aware that she left Brazil to take care of her breast cancer, um, which she already had signs of when, when we helped her move to Brazil in 2008. She was telling us she had a lump in her breast and was going I, to her acupuncturist for care. Yeah, I trusted her intention. All the years we knew her, she said, I'm not going to get breast cancer. So when there were early signs, we, I just had faith that, well, she, she has so much intention that she's not going to get breast cancer that she would make it go away. Unfortunately, it's not to pass. And she relocated to the States and ended up going to Asheville. And we were so ensconced in trying to keep our business afloat in Florida. It was a very different experience for us than in Maine. And um, I wasn't really following her all that closely for a while. And then suddenly it occurred to me, it's like, oh my gosh, she's back in the States and she's going through treatment. Maybe I need to reconnect. And I'm grateful that we did get a chance to reconnect with her 
in November of 2011 um, when Sharon Miller hosted her in Melbourne, Florida. I but I just um, wanted to say that um, to, to come back around at this point in my life and 10 years after Lane's passing to honor her, I have, I'm, I'm looking at the altar that I have over there of her with my frame drum and and uh, Tibetan prayer flags that Lane loved and ribbons from Brazil, um, as well as a few other little things. I, I have a much, much deeper appreciation for her work now um, than ever before. And I don't know why that is. And I was talking to Shelly about that yesterday, just how, how it is that, you know, 10 years after someone's passing, her work is not only still changing lives, we in the Women's Frame Drum Facebook community, and I encourage you all to check that out, we see so many newcomers arriving, you know, and and um, like someone said here that they're teaching a workshop tomorrow and, and giving birth to eight new frame drummers tomorrow. It keeps happening. There are more and more people coming, hearing the sound of the drum, discovering Lane, discover, discovering Krista Holland, Miranda Rondeau, Tehea, um, who am I missing? Any any one of us who well, are out Shearson there? And Tori. Shearson and, and Tori in Maine. Um, thank you. A a any one of us who continue teaching, and you know, a lot of us who were teaching are now gone too, and are drumming with Maine, we're drumming with Lane up in the heavens, um, the mob of angels. Um, there are fewer and fewer of us, and so. Being um, a legacy torchbearer suddenly feels like a huge responsibility and one that I'm like, whoa, I better take this on. And now it's become my obsession and now it's given me a greater purpose. And at 61, I'm grateful for this chapter of my life too, you know? So um, when you say thank you to me, all I can say is thank you for being here because I wouldn't what would I be doing? I would just be blah, blah, blahing about all of this stuff to myself <laughs> and without someone listening, you know, and anytime I find anything of Lane's, I want to just put it out there. There somewhere, there are more and more of these videos locked in a box that no one has access to. And I've had some of my students trying to just channel the passcodes to get into Lane's hard drive so that we can have access to all the work that has disappeared because her face, her um, YouTube channel disappeared where I think a lot of her work had been posted. So again, anytime I find anything of hers, I put it here on my YouTube channel under the playlist called Lane Redmond. And this live stream will continue to be there. Thank you for joining us for our very first one, as well as that presentation that we premiered today. That was from directly from Lane's Dropbox. So you got a big hug from Italy, and she also says... Where are you reading? Show me, please. My eyes are Buscaya. jumping around. Buscaya, duck me over. I don't know what you're pointing to. Big hug from Italy. Ah, hello. Nice to meet you. She also she's Do reading the book. Who is? Buscaya is reading the book. You're reading the book now. It's translated to Italian. As yes, you know. it was translated into Italian this past March by Barbara... Help me, to Natanya. Um, oh, you know Shay. Oh, that's cool. Oh, Shay. Duh, I know you. Hi, Shay. <laughs> um, um, Natanya, what's her name? Barbara Crescimano, who translated Lane's book into Italian and published it last May. So it's in Italian. I, it's been published in other languages. Um, Mario Lane sent to me. She's in the Netherlands. And... She sent to me. Oh yeah, I'm 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 rocking the rocking the socks, y'all. Um, when the drummers were women in Dutch, and according to Lane, it was translated into Persian. I don't know if it's still in print. It was translated into multiple languages, and um, Lane was really hoping it would be translated into Arabic. Um, I think it's yeah really wonderful that it's in a lot of languages to make it more and more accessible. So, uh, Blue Sky, Doc Neo, I'm so glad that you found the book. Let us know how you found it. It's the stories of how people find Lane's book. I think are very telling, 
And so feel free to share with us how you found it. Yeah. Hi, Shay. Shay met me on YouTube. Oh, Barb Crescimano. Am I pronouncing it correctly, Natanya? Crescimano. Um, yeah, Shay found me. Uh, either you found me first or Natanya told you about me when you met her in Italy at a workshop. <laughs> And it's it's really has become a small world through the women's frame drum community and how we um, how we meet each other, and it's a it's a uniquely loving and supportive community. Cultivates that thanks to the heart and soul of Miranda and who she is as a human being. And she and Lane believed that it was so important for women to see each other to see images of women with a drum and to meet each other. And there is so much support for everyone from the newcomer and newbie to the student, to the advanced player, to the teachers. And people find Lane's work and approach Lane's work through various genres. For you, it might be because uh, you're interested in women's history, which I call herstory, um, or ancient art or simply drumming. Maybe you play the djembe and then you discovered the frame drum. Um, there are, you know, so many ways. And as Lane had pointed out in that particular slideshow presentation talk, so much in the yogic tradition relates. So people have, have a, the different paths that lead us to Lane and her work, I think is, is fascinating. Natanya, um, Let's see, Blue Sky, yeah, I'm just trying to quickly read the, the chats. All the Imagine are so beautiful. Images. All of the images, yeah, they really are beautiful. Um, a shaman to read it, yes. And Lane said early on in the book, I don't know what page, but I read this fairly recently and it struck home. I mean, I've read the book so many times. You can pick it up and open to any page and see something new that you didn't really grok before, that the word shaman referred to a woman. It In its roots, it actually referred to a woman. So we don't really have to say shawoman or shamaness. A shaman was a woman and, you know, who used these um, magical trance-inducing sacred tools of the drum, the song, the dance, to bring, as Lane had said, the circle of everyone together. She, she pointed to that circle of, of men and women, archetypally speaking, everyone, the whole, the holistic view, bring all together rhythmically, vibrationally, through frequency of sound into a unified state. And then would use the rhythm, the rhythmic chanting, the rhythmic stepping, the rhythmic drumming to, to deepen that state into, um, you know, into those other states of awareness. It looks like Marta Lee is following in Lane's footsteps. She's in Crete right now. So she must be leading. A, Where are you reading? Uh, from Lisa Curtin. Referring Who I to believe is Marla in Crete Lee. right now, Marla Lee. Yeah, Marla Lee has been leading a group in Crete, and Mara Lane and um, was there, and Suzanne was there from Orlando, and um, yes, Natanya, it was you who mentioned me. Thank you for mentioning me in Italy to someone who was there in a workshop, a frame drum workshop from Florida. Yeah. So Natanya's in Italy, my... thanks to Miranda. Natanya is in Italy. I'm here in Italy, thanks to Miranda. Really? Ah, I remember watching you go from California to Burlington and then on to Italy to study folkloric drum and dance. And I didn't realize it was thanks to Miranda. That's very cool. So Blue Sky, you're saying, I did my shaman frame drum with him. You mean with... Um, who did you do that with? Who I I might have the missed who you one were who talking. told her about Lane's book, and then she says I'm also into core shamanism. She does sound bath ah. using frame drums a lot. 
Oh, and Kata, Khadija is thinking, okay, so um, Marla has been in Greece and you think that um, we need to send her healing vibes that she's not well right now. Um, I was watching through various friends' posts all about their trip in Crete. Yeah, so I, I, I decided, you know, when, just a few weeks ago, I came upon the, the video that we all just watched. And if you didn't watch it, it's still here on my channel of Lane giving a presentation about the Omphalos and the, the Bindu and the vulva snakes. and snakes and <laughs> serpents. It was she said serpents and bee goddess mysteries. And um, I, I came upon it because I was working on a video of my own and I was scouring through the images and I saw that I had um, an actual video of Lane's. It said MP4, Lane Redmond B Priestess video. And I was like, what? I wasn't even aware that I had it. And I thought, oh, I got to get this up on my YouTube channel. And then, so I, I uploaded it. And during the upload process, I thought, because this was just a few weeks ago, oh, I should have it post on October 28th in honor of the 10th anniversary of Lane's passing. And then it occurred to me that I should premiere it because by posting it as a premiere, then y'all could see it, <laughs> you know, hopefully somehow, some way um, I could share it on Facebook with a link and people could see it in their YouTube feed, there would be the, you know, upcoming Elaine Redmond lecture. And then that way it could gather more and more people. I was really hoping that there would be a circle of us. Like Lane said, as, as she was talking to the people who were seated in the circle with her, that all of their heart chakras, because they emanate this way, that all everyone's heart chakras were connected in the circle, that all hearts were connected. And I, as I was watching that with you all just an hour ago, I thought, and all of our hearts are connected through, through the pulse, through this interwebs, these YouTubes, th that we can be together viewing this at, simultaneously to me is something that was unheard of, unprecedented. And, now we are like the mycelium and we are connecting and communicating in the women's frame drumming Facebook group here in YouTube land and the various ways that we find each other and connect with each other, all with the, the, the bindu of the work of Elaine Redmond. Like that is just like the centerpiece to me. And I, I just credit her so much with all that she excavated and unearthed. And that was just who she was just like in that video that I made, um, the, I, I can't even remember exactly what it was called on, on unearthing the excavations of my soul kind of a thing that for Lane doing this research and going to these dark, dank museum rooms to, to view these, these icons that had been revered and processed in temples and in streets of goddesses with frame drums, with processions of women with frame drums and people with sacred oils and chanting sacred texts and, and that whole cultural infusion um, of, of the time. I just, I don't know. My mind, sorry, my mind just goes off because I just picture myself there. Check so, this out. Yes, yes. About the shamans were originally women. What Ziva is saying? Yeah. So Ziva, Amrita, the first shamans were women. Yes, Lane says that in her book, and I just picked that up not that long ago. The word shaman comes from my people in Siberia. I didn't realize that you were there, and I talked to you on Facebook. Yakushia, Mongolia, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, where the outfits of male shamans were there often have breasts because of this. Wow. So they have umphloses and breasts on there. Yeah. Oh my gosh. On their outfits. 
The word shaman was popularized by anthropologist Mircea Eliade, the first to study indigenous shamanic practice on all continents and write about it. Thank you for that. Anyone who wants to copy that and Google it, yes, please. Thank you for sharing so much, Siva. Each culture has their own name for shaman, indeed, but it has been used now around the world among the Shuar, if I'm pronouncing that, here in the Amazon, they use shaman with a CH, but their real word is Uishin. Yeah, isn't that something? How? Thank you for all that background. Thank you, thank you. Fascinating how shamanic practices showed up all over the world in ancient times too. And like Lane said, if you're fasting for nine days and then drumming and dancing and chanting yourself into an ecstatic state, perhaps they used um, hallucinogens or you know anything that they would imbibe, um, would make mead from honey or tincture the blue lotus, whatever whatever it was, or ingest f fungi. It's almost like you don't need that extra stuff. Because like I said, Randy Crafton would say about the drumming, he's in it for the buzz. It creates its own buzz. So yeah, the shamanic practices became uh, and have been worldwide. It's so fascinating how all of those threads and why I love how Lane was just unearthing all of that. MJ is saying, I'm so grateful for all the legacy keepers. Ah, I just purchased Lane's teaching recordings of Rattlesnake and Seven Cent. Where did you find that, MJ? Are those on the Lane Redmond website? If you go to laneredmond.com, there is um, a marketplace there. This is an old, old website that hopefully someday will be um, recreated, revamped. But um, there is a, a marketplace page, and um, you can purchase some of Lane's work there. Of course, what I think is there on that page is the most recent, like what she's even calling giving birth to ourselves. I'm not sure is the same giving birth to ourselves that that I attended. I attended the very first one in Cairo, New York. It's it looks like it says Cairo, like Cairo, Egypt, but they pronounced it Cairo. And that was not far from where Lane and Tommy lived. And that's where a bunch of us were in that first group. If you've heard of Barb and Amy of Blessed Memory and Deb and Holly and Shirsten, Shirsten, Tori and Judy and I, the four of us drove from Maine every month. Shelly, Sherja, Lillian, you know, lots of us continued to to teach. Deidre, Sintra. I mean, I think that many of us. Angie, we went on. Um, Lisa, Quattrochi, we went on to to teach and and um, and share. And Karen Holtzlag, also a blessed memory. So, yeah, I'm grateful for these legacy keepers as well. And Lane's stuff online is probably different than what we are teaching because we are all taking different aspects of Lane's work and blending it with our own. All of us, you know, Krista, Miranda, I love how diverse we all are in what we're offering to the world because then there's more to offer. It offers more breadth and depth and richness and um, the more the merrier. Okay, let's get some okay. of these yeah. questions answered. So, MJ, you're saying Trish DeGroote is keeping her legacy live online. It does what on the website? Just the website. What's how do you get to the website? What's the laneredmond.com? I believe okay. is the URL. So, laneredmond.com. L A Y N E Redmond R E D M O N D. Did I spell it right? Lane yeah. Redmond. Dot com. So you can and buy some of those teachings. You can buy DVDs, etc. Um, it's the next best thing to a live teacher. We, Jeff and I have always said, because it's mm -hmm. visual. But then also keep in mind, you have to, at least I did, and and it was Lori Sweet and um, Karambari Ma who pointed out to me when I purchased those DVDs of Giving Birth to Ourselves um, from Lane's website a few years ago. You have to then email them and say, hey, are there any PDFs? 
because it, they didn't come to me automatically. The downloads came. I had access to download those DVDs that I, after I made the purchase. But if you want the printed out PDFs, the visual rhythms and, and um, other things that Lane had made, charts, et cetera, you got to ask for those. And then you'll get an, an email with those. Blue Sky, I would like to ask a question about frame drums. Yes, ask away. Yeah, and we'll do our best to answer. And Ziva says Iliade has great books on shamanism. Excellent, thank you. Um, MJ is saying it's a very grounding practice to drum with Lane in the DVDs. You're saying and to play rattlesnake or and to play rattlesnake and seven cent. Rattlesnake is a is a duet that Lane and Tommy wrote. Um, and the joke was it was called the piece called the rattlesnake piece before they just <laughs> named it rattlesnake. It's a duet of tambourines that communicate with one another back and forth with various rhythms, high and low sounds and, and the jingles. And um, that's wonderful. And then seven cent that's on trance union, isn't it? That's also um, a CD um, rattlesnake. Did that make it on a CD? I don't remember. Somebody oh, tell me. Um and Seven Cent, I think, is on the, the CD that Lane and Tommy published called Trance Union. And they were really getting into some trancey drumming. And we had a whole second summer after the GBTO six-month training. The following summer, we had multiple months learning Trance Union, Seven Cent, and the, 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 the rhythms in 10. What are those called? I don't know. But the the transunion pieces we were also learning. Yes, yeah, so Blue Sky, uh, um, love to see. Yes, Lisa, Cairo. It was Cairo, New York. Um, it's in the it's in the Catskills in southern New York. And they pronounce it Cairo, but obviously Cairo. We just mispronounce <laughs> things in the United States. So names from around the world. Yes. <laughs> And just to be clear, um, what MJ is saying, Mojo Mine, she is saying that Trish Groot, I believe, is keeping her legacy alive online. Just to let you know, um, Trish is the one behind the curtain, behind the scenes of Lane's website. Um, other than that, those of us keeping Lane's legacy alive in the in the visibility realms, you know, we are on Facebook, we are on YouTube, we are teaching in person. Um, some of us are teaching, are still teaching locally. Many of us are teaching online so that we can reach more people. And many of us are teaching in person around the country and around the world so that we can reach more people because <sighs> Shelly and I were having this conversation the other day. We don't know how Lane would feel about a lot of the teaching being online. Although obviously Lane put her DVDs online because to her it was group ritual and group drumming. And that was the energy that created the vortex that would spiral us into altered states of awareness. And um, when she was talking about the theta state and how hard it is to, how difficult it is to just stay in the theta state without just conking into falling asleep. But it's that deepest meditative state of awareness when you're just like seeing, feeling, hearing, knowing everything. And I think some of us have, have had glimpses of that in our ecstatic moments when we're chanting or dancing or drumming for extended periods. It just suddenly it's just like this overwhelming sense of well-being comes over us. It's just like it comes up and it comes over, it washes over, and we're just enveloped with this sense of just joy and gratitude and love. And yeah, we need more of that in the world. So whenever we go into those states, just emanate it out. So keep sending it out. So a couple more things. Um so Cairo was the site of the first giving birth to ourselves, GBTO, in 1999? 1998. 98. And 99 was TransUnion. And I only remember that because that's when my sister okay. Stephanie so was dying. It was a long time ago, Lisa. <laughs> and I remember that it was 1997 that Jeff and I hosted Lane and Tommy in our space in Maine, in our barn, for Lane to give the version that she had at the time of the slideshow 
and her late and her book had just been published when the drummers were women a spiritual history of rhythm so she had amassed all of these images she the book was being published and every time she gave the slideshow it was slightly different because she had new images or she would swap them out so lane and tommy came to our funky little place without a without a flush toilet in maine and they performed in our space and lane gave her slideshow presentation talk and then she gave a workshop the next day. And I remember her saying that she wanted to have an ongoing immersive training and that she was thinking, why don't I do it here in this space? But there was no, there were no accommodations for people to stay there in little old Mount Vernon, Maine in the, in the rural area. And she really wanted us to be under one roof. And those to me are the best of the retreats when you're living together for those, um, you know, from Friday midday to Sunday midday, you're just eating your meals together, you're living together, you're communing and bonding and drumming and meditating and sharing, doing ritual. Those were the best. So who knows how Lane might feel about those of us who are teaching online, but, you know, the last time I taught online, which was my, my first real online Zoom collective teaching other than the, the presentations that I had given before, there were 44 women around the country and around the world who were present for that. And in the long run, it may not have been for everyone. However, it was a taste of how Lane's work and my work blend and alchemize, and, and this is what I deliver. And that's what everyone who is teaching now delivers. And some of it is online and some of it is, of it is on person and you can access and purchase Lane's stuff on her website as well. So yeah. let's answer uh, Blue Sky's questions. So yes. natural skin drums that are not tunable, that don't have a tuning system, right, you just have to, when they're tight enough because the air is dry enough, whether it's indoors because you have heat or air conditioning or whatever, or on dry days outside, when they're playable, they're playable. If they don't have a tuning system, that's that. So they can be wonderful when they are. And uh, there are some skin drums that have external and internal and through the frame tuning systems. So you get to still, when you adjust them, make use of a skin head, if that's your preference. And you can tell but the story. Almost, almost uh, everybody has some synthetic headed drums, many from Remo. And if you can afford it, Cooperman in Vermont. And... Also, Meinl and other companies are now uh, following in Remo's footsteps with synthetic heads. And many of us have natural skin heads, too, for the aesthetic and for when they do work. And you can tell the story of when Lane was at the... was at a <laughs> Lane hooked up with Remo because she was playing a German orchestral you just uh, down again. <laughs> tambourine with a, with a uh, calfskin, thin calfskin head, uh, playing in an outdoor event. And it went... Flat. All slack, and you could you could dry it out with hair dryer or whatever, but it would only last ten minutes before the ambient humidity would drag it right down again. It was unplayable, and she never wanted to be humiliated like that again. It was a very important gig for her. Where was it her, again? I, I don't remember. It was, it was. It was. I think it was in Europe. Uh, the drum. I'm blanking on the name. I used to carry them. Uh, the the German drum, but she gave that drum to Remo when she hooked up with them and said, make one of your synthetic headed drums based on this. La Fima. And La Fima. Doesn't sound German, but that's where the company is. La Fima tambourine. And that explains why if you look at Lane Redmond's Remo Lotus, there's a handle in there. This is a tambourine that we're talking Because she about just now. gave them this orchestral and orchestral players Hold it like this flat and play it like this. And they have some rosin on it to make thumb friction rolls. It's played completely different. It's not vertical. And that's why that handle is a legacy from the Lafema, because she just gave him that drum. So that's she a tambourine. Didn't, she but, didn't need but that I, handle. But in terms of the shaman type drums, like this one here, that's a Remo that's been decorated. People have both natural skin and synthetic because the natural skin ones are not reliable in terms of climate. The humidity relaxes, or or if it's the air is super dry, then it tight it tightens, and you can't really 
um, depend on what, what note you'll get from, from the frame drum. You want to just lift this up? You just, <laughs> she she really, didn't like me being short. Yeah, thank you. Ah. But I, I'm a slouch or I slide down. But when you're showing your hands, I'm not yes, sure that it's Cooperman's that Yes, are great. They are far more expensive generally, um, if you, particularly if you're getting a tunable one. And many of their, their tunable ones are wonderful. They make a few that aren't tunable. And then, again, it's like any non-tunable skin drum. It's just playable when it is. Yeah, and Ziva and Gwenna are talking about putting the drum in front of the fire and and rubbing it to dry it out, but a fire isn't always handy, nor is a hair dryer or well, like a I say, heating that, pad. That only lasts until it reabsorbs the ambient humidity. So if you're at a fire-based ritual where there is a fire in the center, then yeah, and then they would go up to the fire, tighten their drums well, again, it, and then return to the center. There's circle. a great uh, story about that. When Lane and Shearston, and I don't know who else was on the trip, they were in uh, somewhat oh, Linda, northern... Linda Shelburne. Linda Shelburne, somewhat northern Brazil. Now and now. Marnial, the state yeah, of Marnial. Yeah. And, um, uh, and Kip so was there. So they were there for the Bumba Mayo Boy Festival and all night long, they're doing that step that you saw in the video, right, left, right, left, right, left. And, and Lane stood up and going she around just, I don't know how many, a lot, a lot of people with frame drums is how they do it, going around that bonfire. But at any given time, a third of the people, Lane said, are in at the bonfire drying their drum out because they're all skin drums. They're all skin drums. They're drying them out at the fire. Always keep your hand between the skin and the fire so you don't bleep, melt up your skin head. And uh, so at any given time. Or the third, skin of your hands. Yeah. Or face. Well, your hand will burn before the drum. So that's on you. A third of the people would be in there drying their drum out as soon as it was tight enough to play again. Back into the stepping, chanting. Um, Drumming. Three against two against three rhythm of uh, Bumba Mayo Boy. And Lane and Tommy really got into the Bumba Mayo Boy, the drum up my ox folklore, the story behind it and the reenactments. It's basically a death and resurrection story all over again. And the story goes that there was, there were in Brazil, you know, uh, they share the same dark history that many of our countries do, slavery. And there were two um, slaves, a man and a woman, husband and wife, and the wife was pregnant and she was having a, a craving for the tongue of a bull, you know, to eat tongue. And so the husband in wanting to please his wife went out and slaughtered one of the um, property owners bulls and brought her the, the tongue of the, the ox to eat it. And then um, he was getting in major trouble. And so they had to bring the whole community get together. And remember, this is a, 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 a Yoruba African based culture. This is, these are their roots. These, the, this is the land where they and culture and religion that they were extracted from to live in this new world. And Brazil was kind of one of the hubs. Um, and so they had to pull the community together to drum up the bull back to life, resurrect the bull back to life so that he wouldn't get into trouble. And Jeff and I were traveling in Brazil a second time on our own and then meeting up with Lane. And we were traveling through the town of Lensois and we, came, we heard drumming in the distance one evening. And we, it was, it was actually nighttime, early evening, early nighttime. And we walked through the streets of this little town and came upon a whole community gathering, reenacting Bumba Maya Boy. There were children and elders and everyone there. And they had they drums, had a, tambourine, some people in a bull costume. It was a death and resurrection of the ox. Of the ox. Um, and it was a different story, different characters, not the same as Bumba Maya Boy from San Luis Marniao. Um, but you'll find death and resurrection stories everywhere. Obviously, the most common one in our culture, Jesus Christ. So, but death and resurrection stories, springtime. 
weather-wise, that's that's all there. Um, and Lane's so giving I birth to ourselves. On, I keep harping on ox. Boy in Portuguese. B-O-I. B-O-I, boy, means ox. Touro, like in Spanish, touro. In, in Portuguese, touro uh, means bull. What's the difference? Well, a bull has not been castrated. So they're valuable only for inseminating females and creating more cattle. But the ox has been castrated, therefore tame, and is your tractor. Before tractors came along, the ox was a tractor, incredibly valuable on the farm, the finca, mm -hmm. the plantation. So you can see how much more valuable an ox is. And that's why when the ox dies, it's a huge, huge loss. And there's this huge drumming festival dedicated to Bumpameo Boy and the trance-like rhythms that they play of two beats against three beats, two beats against three beats. Lane and Tommy really dove deeply into studying those rhythms and taught those to us at GBTO as well. And I, I don't know if Lane goes into stuff like that in the DVD series that you can purchase online now. I should just watch those and, and see what the similarities and differences are. And um, because because uh, Lane's work constantly evolved and what you get in the, the DVD series on laneredmond.com is probably the, the, you know, the last um, version, the final version of it. So the hand dance series is the most affordable, I think. Hand dance, is that Lane's or, no, or that's Glenn, Glenn Velez? Glenn Velez uh, uses the, the term hand dance and yeah. Cooperman makes a lot. Uh, there's the Mediterranean line of Glenn's hand dance line. Yeah, so, and he was Lane's first teacher and she partnered with him for quite some time and they performed together. Um, but she went on to develop her own body of work independent of his and they were really extracted from each other's lives for quite some time too but hand dance is yes what Glenn Velez um, refers to as his and forest frame drumming I'm happy to see you here live as well um, is there anything any of you who have made a comment or asked a question that we've missed in the chat please ask it again and like I said I'll just keep talking until more comments and questions come up and I'm here as long as y'all want to be here. And then, and I see, you know, over time people have been leaving and that's fine. You know, um, we'll, we'll probably close this out. I would say, um, within the next 10 minutes or so. Myself and I will be back. Okay, hon. So if anyone has any question, anything, any aha moments, anything that, um, you found of particular interest in Lane's presentation, um, something else that I wrote down, let's see. Mm. Yeah, I think I've pretty much covered, the, you know, the laurel, the umphalos, um, the bromery. You know, stepping was something that was so important to Lane while drumming. We would, we would be seated while learning the technique. And Tommy was our teacher, too. Tommy's a great teacher. Um, we, we might be seated to learn certain techniques so that we could focus on our hands. And then we'd be up and we'd be stepping to the rhythm. It, it, to Lane, it synchronizes the mind-body complex. And that's why she has those walking, breathing meditations that she published over the years that came out with various titles. Um, Sounds True ended up taking on some of those, the, the chakra meditations. And before that, it was the pulse of the earth and sun that Lane sold herself. Um, Yes, and you can use a stick or a mallet with a frame drum. Yes, absolutely. That's the more shamanic tradition to use a beater with a frame drum as opposed to the finger style. I mean, the frame drum is the most universal drum on the planet. It just shows up in so many places. And there are as many techniques out there as there are cultures and different frame drums in each culture. Some cultures might have multiple frame drums, multiple tambourines, and each one of them has its own name. Maybe it has rings on the interior or jingles on it or bells on it or different sizes, different depths of the shell, different sizes of the 
of the actual frame. So um, yeah, the stepping was just really important to her. The, the, the walking and breathing meditations, she said, would synchronize the mind-body complex. And walking, um, stepping in time, you know, Lane was very, she was strict. And if, if you're not stepping in time while you're playing the drum with those who you're drumming, um, when you're drumming with others, that was just so important to just watch the feet. And for those of you who are creating processions, which is my my biggest jam is the tambourine procession, as you could probably tell by, by some of my YouTube presentations. Um, tambourine processions are what I love the most. And from what I learned, and for those of you who are wanting to plant seeds in your community to bring the, these processions into the public arena again, as they once were, it was commonplace to see these processions in the temples and in the streets and how awe-inspiring it is to see them once again at, in festivals and um, at particular rites of passages, whether it's a, a wedding or a memorial service or even, you know, or I shouldn't say just even, but at a festival because it can be such a festive instrument as well. What I learned from experience, and I had a lot of it directing Moonrise, and I'm going to pass this on to you. This is just so important. Watch the feet in front of you in the procession. You can't hear in real time the person who's leading the procession because light travels faster than sound. Sound is slower than light. So by the time the rhythms that are being played by the people in the front of the procession reach you back here, wherever you are in the middle or at the very end, by the time that sound reaches you, it's delayed. So using light as the, as the speed force, <laughs> then like, <laughs> shout out to flash <laughs> using light as the speed for then the visual watching the feet stepping in front of you will keep you in time not that you have to stare you know obsessed about the feet in front of you in the procession but if everyone is stepping to the pulse to the rhythm that's being played and you glance every now and then to the feet in front of you and keep your feet in time with those feet then then whatever your hands are playing will also be in time so that whoever is listening to you out there and around you, wherever they are, will hear you all simultaneously as a unified sound. So just let me just give you that. <laughs> That's just so important to me. And I got that from Lane. So um, I'm going to be strict about that as Lane was. Watch, watch your feet. Watch, watch your feet. Great blue sky. Yes, percussion means striking anything you hit. So whether you're hitting it with your hand or your fingers or your elbow or your forehead or sticks or Are you referring mallets. to this? Are you looking at no, this? I'm looking at I also use the stick with the frame. Yeah, drums. yeah, yeah. So and pianos are percussion instruments because the strings are hit with hammers. Uh, sticks, obviously, what we use on bells. But yeah, any kind of drum with a head gets hit with a beater beaters mallets sticks hands you name it so yeah. yeah there's a lot that can be done also she wants to know if men can do this kind yeah, of yeah that's what i was well for since the mid 1990s i've been doing samba almost every year and, and that's Barbara, brazilian brazilian drumming samba brazilian samba is done in the streets with they have more drums and percussion instruments than any other culture i know of in uh, Salvador, Bahia, the, anyway, in Brazil. And uh, yes, that's done with men and women. And that's a different kind of procession. But there's an amazing, gorgeous beauty to seeing like her moonrise or lanes, mob of angels, a bunch of women with tambourines. It's incredible. Because that's the kind of the premise of when the drummers were women, because women were the sacred keepers of the drum and the the folklore of the of the community and um and of the rhythms and held 
positions of spiritual authority and led these rituals using the, the drum, the song, the dance, and they were so, frame drums. But so men, there are a lot of men, kinds men of processed. processions. But I guess the question would be to you is for the tambourine processions that you lead, that's just women and... Well, Preston and I have talked about that. I have a friend named mm. Preston in San Diego, and he's amazing, a young man. And um, we hit it off right away when I was at the uh, Southern Sierra Goddess Gathering, the year that the Southern Sierra Goddess Gathering welcomed men who wanted to get in touch with their inner goddesses. And Preston was there. And, um, oh, and you did you did capoeira in Brazil. Yeah, awesome. And, and so he, um, I was just seeing Blue Sky's comment. Um, he really took to the frame drum in my presentation and wanted to bring that into his programs. And he um, had a, a job, a position um, in the community for bringing together all, um, all people. He, he worked in the... LGBTQ community bringing people together in certain programs. And he thought that the frame drum and creating processions of men, women, and, and other, you know, and, and um, trans and non-gender and, you know, all, um, all people through a procession with the frame drum was something that lit him up and then COVID hit. So we've yet to um, reconnect. He did, he did buy a frame drum and I, I, um, I would like to reconnect with him and find out what his take on that is because that's someone who I would defer to because that's his strength, how to bring all um whatever gender people identify with together, you know, like Lane said, archetypally it's male and female, but now in today's society, as you know, we, we're all inclusive. Um, however people identify. So how to create a rhythmic procession. Yeah, it's definitely doable. I would think with all of those people, bring in the bells, bring in the frame drums, bring in the tambourines, bring in the shaman drums, bring in the dancers, bring in the chanters, in my view, that's that's what I call drum rise, the art of women's drumming, that we can create a fusion. Lane said in one of her articles um, that she, and I'm paraphrasing here, that she doesn't really adhere to, to ethnic specific drum styles and rhythms, although she may study some of them and play some of them, but she saw herself as a vessel of collecting drum tr traditions and ethnic specific rhythms so that um, she could become like, a, a, be a, a vessel to then create a fusion for that, alchemize them and then create her own. And that's kind of how I see myself as well. I don't, I'm not a real stick, a stickler necessarily for, you know, how it, how it ha was done, how, how it's been done. Well, how are we doing it now? We're moving forward. We are giving birth to a whole new tradition and contemporary culture. And I think that it, that it is the, the rise of the feminine to create these processions that all connect to the pulse, the pulse of life, the pulse of birth. That to me is giving birth to ourselves and anew. We don't know necessarily what the rhythms were that they played in ancient times. We see some of the, the sacred texts, so we know what the chanting and poetry and, and mantras may have been. And the imagery certainly is very telling, but the rhythms, we don't know. And so Lane was pulling together her own contemporary ritual based on what she read and what she saw in the images. and then I, that inspired me. That's what lit me up the most, her talks and presentations, her images, her rituals. And yes, of course, as a, as a percussionist, the drumming, but it was always infused in ritual and it was always immersed in these, like that was part of a workshop that Lane gave. And she kept saying, and we're going to do these things. We are going to drum and I am going to teach you 
the Brahmery, and I, we are going to do these, but I want you to get this. I want you to get this piece, this information of the, the research and the images, because then that's through which um, your, your, your drumming and what you are doing will flow through, the, through as that lens. So you look at those images through that lens and then let it just kind of digest and come out through your heart and hands and then create your own inspired ritual and drum traditions. And no, it's not just women, because I would remember that uh, David Budd was part of the first GBTO. Yes. Because the book is called When the Drummers Were Women, and uh, it's about women in that history, it has attracted by far mostly women mm. to Lane's workshops and, and work, and uh, nothing wrong with saying, let's do this as a group of women or let's do this as a group of men. It's a different energy, a different power. So sometimes those separations happen, but Lane was not exclusive. Um, yeah, she incorporated, and, she, she invited and David to MJ, MJ's comment about, uh, well, Yes, I agree. I'm sure. Seeing the frame drum more and more, it's beautiful and yeah. exciting to me as well, believe me. <laughs> and MJ, if, you haven't, if you haven't been teaching anybody yet, eventually you will probably be teaching, right? <laughs> and continuing to spread it. Well, let's hope that that grant goes through and I can come up to Minneapolis, St. Paul and help plant the seeds so that you all can keep nurturing those sprouts. Oh, and and Natanya says, I feel that with the dance. Yes. And I love that you're incorporating the drum and the dance together because they, they are a marriage. I, I, before I was ever a drummer, I was a dancer. I trained in college and danced all the time. And that was, that was my art form. That was my form of expression. And uh, in my, in my early adult years, and then I came to, to the drum and, I came to realize as a drummer, a percussionist, that the drum and the dance are a marriage. How can you drum without stepping? Because that's that's like the dance of the drummer. How can you be listening to drumming without moving your body? I I uh, I came to the drum through the beat in my that I felt in my body. It to the drum. may have been Nana Stefan Collins who studied in Ghana. That's his name, Nana Stefan Collins. This is back in the in the mid nineties. He he studied in uh, in Ghana. <clears throat> and there's a drum that we call a pan logo drum, K P A N L O G O pan logo. And he explained to us that in Ghana, there's no such thing as a pan logo drum, or the pan logo dance, or the pan logo song. It just is. Pan logo refers to all of that. And he said there's no way they could separate one element of pan logo, like the drum or the song or the dance. So they would never in their language say the pan logo drum. Or Get the your pan, pan logo, logo dance. drum and play the pan logo rhythm so we can do the pan logo dance and sing the pan logo song. No, it's just let's do pan logo. And that is all mm -hmm. encompassing of the song, the dance, and the instruments. Absolutely. Oh, now y'all are talking in a <laughs> language that we don't know. Oh, uh, yeah. Italian, I'm guessing. <laughs> CC. <laughs> well, it's coming on time to close, I think. Um, I've enjoyed being here with, with Jeff and with Whoa. all of you. Thank you for gathering after that um, amazing video presentation. I'm so grateful that Lane created that. I don't know that many of her slideshows were videotaped. I'm grateful to whoever that was who edited it and made it available in her Dropbox. I'm grateful that it became, it came into my awareness just a few weeks ago before we hit the road for our 17 day road trip um, that I happened to find it and publish it and set it as a premiere. I'm so glad that all of this has happened and I often feel like it's Lane orchestrating things from the beyond. She pulled Karen and Shelly and um, back into our, um, well, when Jeff and I were traveling, suddenly it was a very spontaneous thing to get together with two old friends. One was my GBTO roommate and one was a former student of mine, ours. 
and while we were on the road, it was all very spontaneous. And I just feel like Lane is orchestrating a lot of this and bringing more and more of us together. The web, our web continues to be woven. We keep finding each other through the drum, through Lane. And I think that's a real beautiful thing. Well, so, yeah, like so thank you. Two people you. in Italy are going to connect up. Good. <laughs> oh, so you guys are going to get together. Great. That's really great. We'll let you know when we're in Italy. We would love, we would love to be. Um, and, you know, we're, and we're open to travel anywhere and, and share. We did some of that last summer in various locations. And I think like 13 different workshops between here and New Hampshire. We are located in Florida. I've had invitations out of the country, but then various reasons they ended up not even getting off the ground. Space wasn't available, this and that. COVID would flare up again, whatever. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, we're, we're here. This is what we do now. This is us. So, yeah. Oh, thank you, Natanya. Yes, we'll come to Italy. So thank you so much for being here. And yes, on this lunar eclipse, which happens in one hour's time on this day that we celebrate and honor Lane on the 10th anniversary of her passing. So yes, it's a, may, it, may these shifts, I agree, be only bringing bright blessings to all of us. So thank you everyone for being here. Just sending lots of love. Don't be strangers. This will still be up on my YouTube channel. You can probably still comment too. And I'll see them. And I'll see you all again soon, I hope, on Facebook, on YouTube, or in person, or on Zoom, or however. Love to you all. Have fun wherever you are. Yeah, thank you, everybody. With or without us. <laughs> Thanks for joining our first live stream. Bye for now. Bye.